This is Rod Jones for One Lord, One Faith, One Baptism.net and Edifying the Body Ministries. And this is our endeavor to do just that, edify the members of his body. And what we're doing today, we're looking at prayer according to the will of God. Not our will, but according to his will. And how to pray as we ought. And to take that verse from uh, when it talks about for we know not what to pray for as we ought. But we're going to look at how we ought to pray. Because prayer is something that it affects, it, it's, it's something that, that the natural man turns to in his times when, when uh, of need, uh, when he wants to make an appeal unto God, uh, oftentimes thanksgiving unto God, um, and, and just to, to let God know his heart. And what we have to understand the only way we can do this properly, the way God designed, is we have to understand what His will is. Because it's got to be done, it ought to be done the way His Word says, by His will. And, but in order to, 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 to have His will, His thinking on the matter, you have to be as David. One was a man after God's own heart. And also as Solomon. Solomon, Solomon was a man after God's own thinking. But, but what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at some verses to show how we ought to pray as we ought and how we ought not. Because oftentimes uh, we see man today, uh, when, man, when man says they pray unto the Father, they, um, when they pray, they expect a response. They expect either a response because their circumstance, circumstances um, is changed or uh, that God would change those circumstances a response as if um, God's going to audibly speak to them and you know when man does this when man does things like that when he says I know God's voice or he prays on to God and then he says God speaks to him he just replaces that he just automatically have has God say or has his conscience his inner man Say something as if God would say it. He'll even change change the tone. And this might sound outlandish. It, it, it might, but when you understand what God's word says, it would be unland, outlandish to, to, to tell someone that they are receiving revelation today. That God is giving, the, the, the God from, from, from heaven has, has, is given unto man, yea, hath God said, God breathed words. But man wouldn't have the actual um, nerve to write it in a book or write it on the back of the book of Revelation. He's not going to do that. But again, in prayer, we, we, we can't expect a response. It's not how the way God uh, designed his word to, to be amongst uh, man. But let's do this. Let's get into the study here. Come over to Romans chapter 8, and let's take a look at um, verse uh, 26. Romans chapter 8, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, uh, for we know not what to pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings uh, which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts, do you see that? He that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to our will, according to what we want, according to uh, what we're going to do anyway, and we're just ask, asking God to co-sign on it? No, according to the will of God. Now, and looking at that there, you, you see it says that the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. That's the Word of God itself maketh intercession for us. When we take these verses and we look at what these verses say, we can take certain verses and say, uh, he, he's, he's conforming me to the image of his Son. We're going to look at that verse next. You can take a verse like that and say, this is not who I am in Christ. I'm being conformed to the image of his son. Oh, you could take verses 
when you're going through problems. For I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Hey, there's many verses. We're going to go over these verses that we ought to have as a saying within us when we go through these problems. But you see, it said, according to the will of God. That's where your prayer ought to be. Your prayer ought to be designed according to his will, not yours. We're suffering for Christ's sake, not our sakes. And we're gonna we're gonna get into that. Come over, come to, uh, down to verse twenty eight. Romans eight verse twenty eight. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now I'm gonna be doing a study on the real love of God, and we're gonna cover this about the uh, when it says to them who are the called according to his purpose. That's not saying to them who are called according to his purpose. No. That would be any justified saying. This is saying to them that love God. That's them that understand the selfless love of God and are and are willing to suffer for for Christ's sake because they display the real love of God. And the according to, according to notice it says his purpose. Before it says his will. This is saying his purpose now, as you see here, uh, verse 29. This is the verse I just talked about there. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. We're brothers and sisters with the Lord, folks. You're being conformed to the image of his son. And that ought to be marvelous and glorious in your sight. Now, if you're being conformed to the image of his son, God didn't deliver the son out of his sufferings. When, the, when, when, the, when, when um, uh, Paul himself suffered, and we're going to look at those verses, he wasn't delivered. But what they did, and the other apostles and the other disciples did, they operated upon a doctrine. They operated upon the Lord's will. What they did was for the Lord's sake, not theirs. They operate upon a hope doctrine. They put their hope in things which they see not. They put their hope in the glory that is to come. And we are to also. If you put your hope in this, this world here and deliverance from, from sufferings, uh, praying to the Father, please take this away from me. Uh, uh, please, I, I, I can't go through. What's going to happen is it's going to be to your own sorrow. Because it's not going to uh, 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 be taken away from you by God. Now, circumstance might make it taken away. Just plain chance. Things can be taken away. And again, as I said in all the videos, if the natural man can have things taken away from him, and when I say natural, I mean unsaved man can have things taken away from him, God's not doing that. Because he's not going to do something comparable to what a man can do. God's not going to do anything for us that we can get done for ourselves on our own. We pray that we get, we come out of bankruptcy. We pay, pray that we, uh, uh, that there's a healing. Well, those things happen to the natural man, to an unsaved man. God's not going to show His power in 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 mere things that a man can do. I don't care what we think, but we'll we'll pray for God to do something for us that we're going to do anyway. We'll say, "Well, you know, I'm going to go get uh, apply for that apply for that new position, Lord. You know, I uh, pray that uh, that that it come to pass." People ask the same thing when it comes to uh, sports. They pray for their team, hey, you know, or, or God bless America. And you know, this world, what this world has done to prayer, the, how prayer ought to be, is it turned prayer into something that you can achieve as if it's earthly blessings. Almost as a genie effect, where you rub the bottle or you rub the lamp and, and, and then you can get something that you can, that you can see. You're told, for hope, told to hope for that you see not. 
You're told to set your affection on things above, not on things of this earth. You're told not to mind earthly things. That's praying according to the will of God. You're not to be after your flesh, but after the spirit, after his, what his word says. Now let's, let's move on to the next one. Come over to Proverbs chapter 23. Proverbs 23. Let's take a look at verse 15. Proverbs 23, verse 15. My son, if thy heart, if thine heart be wise, my heart shall rejoice, even mine. Yea, my reign shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Now you see here, this is talking about the how the father to son, how the father's heart can be can rejoice when the heart of the son is wise. Also, when their lips speak right things. See, this is talking about mature prayer. It's talking about when a, when a saint prays mature unto the Father. When the saint prays mature unto the Father, it is the Father's heart himself can rejoice. Because you're, you, you, you're, you're thinking like he does. You're doing things with him and what he's doing. And today, we oftentimes like to follow what this world does. And we think nothing's wrong with that. Today, we have, um, today, uh, as I'm filming this video, it's what people call Good Friday, as if there's a, a certain day that, that we ought to um, uh, place upon other days, and that's not the case. Every day is supposed to be a Good Friday or Easter or whatever, which is, those are days that man came up with. You're told you ought to remember the Lord's death till he come every day. It's a non-stop thing. And we're going to go over that when we cover the Lord's Supper, Lord's Table issue. So, but enough of that. But I brought that up because um, I'm driving uh, in my city and I see someone, they had a, a, a little sign outside. It said, Pr uh, prayer drive through prayer drive through half mile down, uh, handing out free crosses. So you drive up to a parking lot somewhere. Somebody stands there, prays for you or whatever the situation is, and send you on your way. And of course, they would love a donation. They won't say that, but they feel they give you one of those crosses. You're going to get, it's always something in it. But is that how God designed his word to be done? Is that how God designed prayer? That a person can drive on up and somebody pray for them? You see all these bumper stickers. 1-800-PRAYER-LINE. That's not how God would have you to commune unto him. That this is what man does to exalt himself. Man wants you to go to him to make intercession for you to the Father. You have to think about that. You have people in, in these church buildings today, even amongst grace churches, they'll say, well, we're, uh, we're taking prayer requests. And what is that supposed to be about? I'll tell you what it's about. They want you to tell them what you want to pray about, where they would make intercession. In other words, they're assuming they want you to feel that they have the power to make this get to heavenly places. You know where they get that verse from? When it says, let your requests be made known unto God. That's where you get the request word from when they prayer requests. But actually, let your requests be made on, known unto the pastor. See, folks, this is the evil world we live in. And when man says things like that, Prayer, we're taking prayer requests. All he's doing is telling you that this is what we're doing for you. We're, uh, uh, by my divine power, we're going to help. And, and we all as a body, a group of believers, will be able to get that thing accomplished for you. We're all going to pray and it'll make sure it come to pass. But guess what? Man will never reckon that these things will be so. 
If you ask someone who said, well, I'm going to pray that, that whatever comes to pass, they will not reckon that to be true. They won't count that to be true. They won't be fully persuaded for that to happen. They know it's not going to work, but they'll say, well, it didn't work. Maybe we don't know God's time. We, don't, we just don't know when God will put things in, in order. You know, in other words, God can't get around to it. He's gonna, you're on a waiting list. That's just man's way of showing, telling you something when it doesn't work, so he can save face. And you know what we do? We fall for hook, line, and sinker. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe God, he, he, he never, never try to go ahead. God, gotta wait on him. All those different sayings, because they know for a fact it won't work. But they'll, they'll continue to have faith, is what they'll say. And again, folks, I'm not getting upset with the people. People, I'm not, it's the doctrine. It's the doctrine. That doctrine of ungodliness is, is working today. And it has men thinking, and women thinking, that our God works in a carnal, carnal way. That his will is shown to us in a, on a, of a carnal nature. And that's cheapening the power of God. That he's going to give you, just say wealth, when an unsaved man can have wealth. How would he give you something that, any, that, that another man can get for another man? Well, let's move on here. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's take a look at a couple of things here. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And let's take a look at verse 2. Ye are our epistles written in our heart known and read of all men for as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us written not with ink but with the spirit of the living God see that the spirit of the living God not in tables of stone but in the fleshly tables of the heart do you see where all, his word is supposed to be written his word is supposed to be written within your hearts and I know most people say well, yeah, it's written in my heart, but not when it comes to things that their soul wants. Not when it comes to things that their flesh desires. And I'm not talking about the lustful things of the, 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 the drinking, fornicating. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about the stuff that we, that we lust after when it comes to something that we call godly. Or this world has called godly. When it comes to something about achievements, gains, whether it's health, wealth, relationship, those type of things. We write that on our hearts the way this world um, says we ought to be content. And we ought not do that. But come over to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And let's look at verse 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 9. But as it is written, I have not seen or ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, that love him. Now notice it says the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Now remember we've seen over in Romans chapter 8 when it says to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And God has things in store for the ones that, uh, that, that the saints that, true, that have the true love of God. God has prepared things for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. That's by his word. For the spirit, in other words, the word of God searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. And, and those deep things of God and those things that you see there. Those are all those are the things that we ought to pray for. And when, when we say when it says for we know now what to pray for as we ought, these things we are to pray for. Now, and those things we already have, as you see it says, He hath revealed them to us by His Spirit, by His living word. It's the only way you're gonna find them. You're not gonna do as some do today and uh, pray to God and ask God, well, God. Uh, 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 you know, if, if you're 
if your uh, uh, spirit can move on us as we're doing this study, or, or God, uh, let your spirit guide us. You're supposed to put your nose in a book. God's not going to uh, choose you over any other saint. I don't care how much you tight you close your eyes. He's not going to choose your prayer, your 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 your, your prayers, your your uh, 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 session, your Bible study session because you're praying that it's that it's so. Don't you think other people are praying for the same thing? And then they'll leave out of there knowing the same thing they they learned before. God's not going to give them partial knowledge. You've been given all knowledge. All you got to do is put your nose in the book. With understanding, it's about his will. Looking at the scriptures with a spiritual mind. But today, we have man doing things, whereas they have things like prayer closets. They have power prayer hours. They have all these different things where they uh, uh, join together and think that if it's enough of them, uh, the prayer is going to get across. And what happens, and I ask you, what happens if we do not open a study in prayer? That's what some people feel. They have to open a study in prayer or end a study in prayer. I'm not saying that's, there's anything ungodly with that at all. I'm not saying that at all. But it's the repetition part about it. We, we're not to do prayer. Uh, we're not to pray with repetition. Same old thing or at the same old time. Well, I pray before I go to bed or I pray at a meal or I pray here or I pray... It's supposed to be praying without ceasing about the things of God, not your things. Well, this says in, in all things, yeah, in all your sufferings, in all the things that you're going through, you pray unto the Father with thanksgiving. You thank him that you're you thank him that you're counter worthy to be using his word in your sufferings to help you get over, to help you to console you. The consoling doctrine to help us get over what we what we go through. That's knowing God as the God of all comfort, who comfort us in all our tribulation, not just some of them. Well, let's read on. Come over to the, come down to uh, verse eleven. Verse eleven. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. And, and this is telling you here that man doesn't, all man knows is the spirit of man, this world. That's all he knows. The spirit of God is his word. Man, the natural man doesn't know what, what God's thinking is. He doesn't know God's word. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. The reason why I'm going through this is to understand about those things, what we ought to pray for as we ought. We ought to pray for the things that are freely given to us of God, and that is spiritual. Look, and let's take a look. Which things we also speak, not in the word which the Holy, which the man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Evidently, folks, the things that are freely given to you of God has to be spiritual. Because it says right here that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. And only, you're told here, comparing spiritual with spiritual. This is not man's words, but the Holy Ghost words or the, the spirit. Now, that's telling you there that anything you ought to be praying for is things that you cannot see. That you'll never have as a possession. And the only thing you can put your hands on that we are given to of God is the word that we can hold in our hands. I'm not talking about the individual Bibles. This I could take this and throw it in the fire and go get another one at Walmart or something like that. I'm talking about his word, what is on the pages of the book, what was written on the pages of the book there. That, that's what we ought to uh, 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 set our affection on. That's what we ought to hope for. That's what we ought to be zealous about. But let's read on. Come over to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Let's take a look at verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith 
therewith to be content. Now Paul is saying here that whatever state he is in, and he's going to tell you whether he's down or whether he's up, whether he's whatever, he's learned to be content in all these states. But guess what? He's learned to do this. He had to learn this. Experience, patience worth experience. Patience, patience worketh experience and experience hope. Look at what he says here. I know. This is what he's learned. He, he, knows, he knows this now. Both how to be abased. I know how to abound. He knows how to do this. And uh, everywhere, in, in all things, notice in them, he's going to be going through all these. All things. He's going. He's in all things. He, I am instructed. He's instructed with doctrine. Both to be full and to be hungry, to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ Jesus, which strengthen me. Many people take that verse 13 there. And they put it on their arm as a tattoo. They put it on their bumper sticker, on their refrigerator magnet, all these things. And they take that to say, or assume, that this is talking about something that is not talking about at all. Paul is telling you here to be content in, in all things. Well, I don't care what's going on in your life. Be content. But today, what people do is, they'll take a verse like that. And they'll, that, that will be their calling card, so to speak, to say, I can do all things through Christ Jesus with strength in me. And, and, and as if whatever goes on, God's going to be right there physically. God's going to be right there carnally. And some people say, well, yeah, not all the time. No, not none of the time. He's not going to be there none of the time carnally or physically. And I can prove it. You're told, you're told, you just seen what Paul said, what Paul went through. In all those things, in them, he didn't get delivered from those things either. The Lord wasn't leading you. It, it, we're talking about a different story here, even with Paul as an example. Paul was given revelation to write it down. There were certain things that God was speaking through Paul. And we're going to look at some verses. We're going to go back to the verses that talk about praying and asking and believing, ye shall receive. And you're going to see, folks, that that was talking to the apostles. That wasn't talking to me and you today. It's not a prayer that we can even apply to our life. We can't even, we, we, it won't get done. But let's, let's take a look at some other stuff. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. Be thou therefore, be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, be the, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. And see, because the power of God works, when we are going through affliction, it puts the power of Christ and the power of God on display. Who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which is given us before the world began. Now, what you see there, you, you see, talks about that power of God, the afflictions that work within us. It ought to produce something, whereas it ought to be where when we're weak, Christ's strength is made perfect in our weakness. That, that, that's where it ought to be. When you take his word and you allow his word to work for you, it's going to strengthen you. It's going to put the power of Christ on display. And the angelic realm can revel in the wisdom of God. The manifold wisdom of God can be made known by the church, as Ephesians 3, 10 through 11 tells you. Let's look at something else. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And let's take a look at Paul when Paul went through all the things he went through. And I'm going to take a look at some of these things and see if Paul himself was delivered. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Now, I'm going to stop there because... Paul is going to be looking upon, looked upon as a fool. He's looked upon as a fool because he was carnally going through things. Other people wasn't. He was talking about spiritual and inner man doctrine. They were talking about carnal and what they can see and outer man doctrine and circumstances. But notice what he says here. I am more in labors, more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons, more frequent, in deaths, off. That's death. That's not in depths or anything like that. That's deaths. And, and, and we can talk about that later. 
of the Jews five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. Now, you see those things, that just some of those things that Paul went through? We're going to read more. But just take some of those things. And Paul says deaths often. When Paul got stoned, he was stoned to death. But because he wasn't done writing God's word, Paul couldn't die yet. Paul was bitten by the, by the viper, shook it off. A natural man would have died. But, and someone said, well, how do you know it was, it was poisonous? Well, it, it tells, well, why would that be brought up in Scripture? I'm pretty sure it, it, uh, some of the disciples probably walked through whatever and got bitten by a garden snake. I'm not talking about that. But Paul says deaths oft. And not just that beaten, all those things we've seen. Where's the deliverance, folks? Where's the physical deliverance? Paul didn't ask for deliverance out of those things because he knew something. He learned something. As Philippians 4 said, he learned to be there with content in any and all sufferings. Now let's read on here. Verse 26. In journeys, in journeys, often. In perils of waters. In perils of robbers. Notice it says in, in this, in that. In perils of robbers. In Perils of mine own countrymen. And when this is, he's talking about perils, he's having times where he wants to just despair of his life. That perils of water, meaning when, when something's perilous, it means life threatening. Paul could have died in those times. A natural man would have died in these times. In perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils of the by the heathen, in perils in the city. In perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings, uh, often, often in cold and nakedness. Um, besides those things, with, with that were or without that which come up upon me daily. The care of all the churches. Now you see that there, the he's talking about just even the natural care of the churches. But not one of these things would someone say, well, all oh, these things I go through. But what you see take place here is Paul is in all these things here. In these things. And there's no deliverance there. What you see is there's no deliverance, but what you are going to see in the next verse, you're going to see what Paul did. Paul, Paul explained what all he went through. But also he explained when he besought the Lord or begged the Lord three times that something depart from him, that these things, that these things depart from him, and he, he not be um, uh, 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 go through these tr troublous times. It was trouble in his soul. He was pressed out of measure above strength. He despairing even of his life. Let's take a look at what the Lord told him when, when he prayed unto the Father. Because that wasn't an intelligent prayer when, when Paul prayed that something be taken away from him. That was a carnal prayer. That was a fleshly player, prayer. And Paul didn't know what to pray for as he ought either. Let's look at this. 11, uh, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 29. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is offended? And I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will rather glory in the things, the things which concern mine infirmities. The Father of God, God and the God of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forever, know, uh, forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. Now Paul says here, if he wants to glory in something, he's going to glory in the things which concern his infirmities. And there's a reason why Paul is going to say that. Because Paul learned something. He learned, he learned that it's not about his sake. It's not about his will. It's about the Father's sake. It's about the Lord's sake. It's about the will of God. That wouldn't have been the will of God to have Paul taken out of those things. And when Paul was in those perilous times, it wouldn't have been godly to have that taken away from Paul. And folks, it's not godly 
to have it taken away from you either. We will be of no no um, uh, no no good unto the Father in His purpose. If we had, if Father, if the Father was taking these things from us, it couldn't reach His objective. But it's reaching; it would reach the objective of the person going through it because now they don't have to go through it now. But His objective, He's putting His power on display through us. And we know that, I know you know the verses, when Satan speaks reproachfully of the saints, he loves, he wants the opportunity to speak reproachfully. Look at another saint down there begging for this stuff to be taken away. Everyone knows the story of Job and how Job was, was, was went through all those things and whatever. What if Job just wanted to throw in the towel right there? But let's move on. Come on, 2 second, second Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And let's take a look at verse um, let's look at verse 5. And, and let's take a look at how what Paul, you know, we've seen what Paul learned. But let's take a look at what Paul talks about when he says he liked to he would rather glory in his infirmities. Look at uh verse 5. Of such an one will I glory, yet of myself I will not glory. Notice of myself. That's his flesh too. That's outer man but in my infirmities this is where he wants to put the glory at in his infirmities but see guess what he's going to seem as a fool for glorying when he suffers the natural man would think you're a fool if you say I'm exceeding joyful in all my tribulations but look at what he says for though I would desire to glory I shall not be a fool for I will say the truth but now I forbear lest any man should think of me above that which he see me to be or heareth me to be. Now, Paul is saying, you, you see what's going on there? Paul talks about glorying in his infirmities. But that's oftentimes, like I said, to be looked upon as a fool in the sight of, a, of the natural man. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. He, he, neither can he know them. They're spiritually discerned. We're, we are to be fools for Christ's sake. Not that, that the, the, um, the godly are having things taken away, but it's the opposite. You're told, yea, that all that will live godly shall suffer persecution. It's a given. When you, when you start, when you speak to people about spiritually minded things only when you tell people oh well all these days you're observing this is man-made days um, uh, when you tell people about don't set your affection on things you can see only on things above I know because I know what I hear what people tell me you you're being too extreme isn't that too extreme or being extremism showing extremism you're hyper dispensationalist. Now, you think about this. You're going to hear that. And the reason why you're going to hear it is, yea, all that will live godly. Every saint is not going to live godly. That's why it says, yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But let's read on here. Come over, come down to verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh of the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now you see here, evidently, it's a messenger of Satan. He must have had a message for him. But notice in the flesh, there was a thorn in the flesh. Paul knew that his flesh cried for something. It was his flesh uh, making, a, making an appeal to his soul. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. Paul wanted it delivered from him. Paul didn't know what to pray for as he ought at this time. But Paul was getting, given an education. And look at what the education was. And he said unto me, the Lord said this unto him, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Now, you see it, it said there, 
But the Lord told him, my grace is sufficient for thee. Do we think that when we come to the Lord about some things that we, we want? Or we, or we think we need? Or we, it could be the dire most, it could be a dire situation. It could be one of our loved ones on a deathbed somewhere. And we'll, we'll want to ask for prayer from that, our deliverance from that. God's not going to deliver that circumstance. God's not going to, to uh, uh, deliver that person but not deliver another saint. Why would he do that? What does that saint have uh, more than this saint? How is that saint any better in the sight of God who hath dealt to every man the measure of faith? But to us, when our natural man craves for it or wants it to make an appeal, we, we don't know what to pray for as we ought. But when we think about making that prayer, think about this. Is God's grace sufficient enough for you? In other words, is what, I, is what God done for you enough? You have to think about that. Is what God has done for you already and has given you in his word? Wouldn't, shouldn't that be sufficient enough? And that's what he's telling Paul. My grace is sufficient for thee. And Paul says, most gladly, therefore. In other words, now I get it. Well, let's read on here. Verse 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. Now, doesn't that sound foolish? It does to some, to some who are um, uh, the natural mind, carnal-minded people. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. I am become a what? What is he saying here? I am becoming a fool. I become a fool in glorying. Ye have, ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been com commended of you. For nothing I am behind the chief apostles, uh, though, though, I be, though I be nothing. And Paul is being facetious there. He says he's a fool in glorying. That's the way they look upon him. Why? Because he takes pleasure in infirmities. And in all those things, in all those persecutions and everything you've seen on that list, Paul takes pleasure in those things because he knows the power of Christ is resting upon him. And in Christ, and in his weakness, Christ's strength is made perfect in his weakness. Now, that ought to be an example for us. When we pray for things, when we, as Paul didn't know what to pray for, he, as he ought also, but he prayed according to the will of God, according to God's purpose, them who are the called according to his purpose, not our purpose. Praying according to the will of God. Let's look at something else. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, let's look at verse 16. For which cause we faint not. Of course, we got reason to faint in all our tribulation and sufferings. But, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. This is something we ought to remember when we're going through things. When we're going through things and our outward man is seeming like it's one thing after another. One thing's piling up after another. We ought to remember that verse. For our light affliction is but for, but for a moment. Wait a minute, how can Paul say light affliction? You've just seen all the things Paul went through. But he says light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding eternal way to glory. If you know that something you're going through works for you, why would you want to take it away? And it works for you in eternal value. Why we look not to things which are seen, but the things which are not seen, but the things which are seen are temporal, Things which are not seen are eternal. Now, that ought to be verses that we ought to replay back and forth in our mind. Those verses, they ought to be memorized in our head. You know, I was talking to um, uh, a beloved sister um, on, on Facebook there. And she says, it, it's not one thing, it's another. She's been going through problems for the longest. And many times she even despaired of life. But... Because of the strength of God's word, strengthened her. And see, 
we we ought to take we ourselves ought to take certain verses like this when it seems like everything is crowding around us and everything it can't get any worse all you have to do instead of asking God why or thinking this is a test or God will heal you out of this you have to come to understand read what the verses say though the outward man perish yet the inward man is renewed day by day that's the man God's working on he's working on your inner man and he's renewing it day by day with doctrine but you got to put your nose in the book so to to renew your inner man renew it becomes newer and newer and newer it, it begins to outgrow the outer man Let's look at something else here. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's take a look at verse 1. For we know that if this earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And this is what we're looking at. We're seeing what your, your emphasis upon your flesh, your outer man, what that ought to be. And this is right after Paul just told you the verses we just read. While we look not the things which are seen, and the things which are seen are temporal, things which we see are eternal. Hey, then he comes and tells you this right here. In other words, look folks, don't, don't worry about that earthly house of yours. It's going to dissolve. Worry about what's inside. Worry about the inner man. For in this we groan, and we do groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with, with a house, which our house, which is from heaven. And that's not a moaning groan. That's not, oh, well, oh, I'm going through. No, that is a earnestly desiring groan. This is the type of groan that is. You can't wait till that takes place. Otherwise, why would it say earnestly desiring to be clothed upon? If so that we be clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened not for that we be unclothed but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life that shows you there you, you ought to have a, a earnest fervent desire to be clothed upon to know that this earthly tabernacle is going to dissolve not to you, that you put trust and hope in this but we oftentimes oh i'm going through something i have to go through surgery or something like that and oh god make sure i May God, it's okay. This earthly house is going to dissolve, folks. But your inner man is supposed to be renewed day by day with doctrine. That, that shows you the emphasis that God places upon our earthly house. You know, you have some saints that are paralyzed. Some saints are paralyzed and can't even, uh, uh, can't move, haven't been able to move since they became justified. God doesn't, it's not that God doesn't love them because they're not healed out of their circumstances. There's some saints that, that, that are deaf, some saints that, that are blind, yeah, but that doesn't change God's love for them. He's not going to change their circumstances. He's not going to change yours either. I don't care how many charlatans that there are that say, that have, show about the power of prayer, and all that is, is a man wants power himself. He wants you to call his phone line and he's an intercessor to God for you. Or you come and make prayer requests onto this man. I don't care who he is. And he's going to, oh, any prayer requests? Oh, yeah, I was praying. I want uh, people to pray for my so-and-so because uh, they're, they're in the hospital right now. So now what's happened is now there's supposed to be power in that, evidently. Prayer is a one-on-one -on -one commune with you and the Father. One-on-one -on -one commune with you to the Father in intelligent sonship prayer. Where you are praying unto the Father, Father to Son. And you are giving thanks unto Him and how his, what all He's done for us. The things that He hath prepared for them that love Him. All the things we read. Thank Him for conforming you to the image of His Son. There's so many, there's a long list of things I can give you that we ought to give thanks on to. Your prayer can be an hour long. <laughs> but what I'm trying to explain is that we ought not pray as this world prays. 
We ought to pray according to his will, not ours. Let's go to the next verse here. Come over to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Let's look at verse 1. If ye, be, if ye then be risen with Christ, and we are, folks, seek those things which are above. In other words, why would you be seeking something on this earth and your citizenship is in heaven? What would you want with the earthly things of this world? They can't benefit you. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections, set your affection on things above, not on things on this earth. Notice the things that it says. See, an ungodly son would want the things on this earth, meaning he'd want deliverance. He'd want what he can see, health, wealth, relationship. For ye are dead and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye also shall appear with him in glory. And you're told there, folks, set your affection on things above. What your heart wants, that's what the affection is about. You can be affectionate with some, something. That's, that's more than love. That's something that grips your heart. That's something that you long after. And those things, look, that can also be included in healings. That can be included in, 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 other, in signs and wonders. What I mean by signs and wonders, God working out a circumstance for you. Or God changing the circumstance. Or matter of fact, whatever you do in life as you walk on a daily so-called blessed day, that God would make things, everything that had the Midas touch for you. Everything you touch turn to gold. That's not what God is doing at all. That's what man wisdom come up with. Because that doesn't happen, folks. But man's wisdom would say that, th that it does. And, and let's go over some verses to show where all this stuff comes from. Come over to the book of Matthew. Come over to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. And let's look at verse 20. Matthew 21, verse 20. And when the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How soon is the fig tree withered away? And Jesus said unto them, Notice who he's talking to here. Verily I say unto you, If ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. It shall be done. Now you see, this is beginning the um, uh, beginning to the verse, the verses that people talk about, but they don't talk about this one here. When it said pray and asking and believing, ye shall receive. Read, they look at the context. Jesus also said this here, that if they have faith enough, they can say to this mountain, be removed, and it can be cast in the sea. It's going to be done. Why don't they use this verse? Why don't they ever use this verse? which is right next to the next verse that we're going to be looking at. Because this is talking to the apostles. What the Lord gave for his apostles is not what he gives us to live by or that he tells us that, well, this is going to be done to you. There were commands given to his apostles who are going to sit upon 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel in authoritative uh, 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 position. That's not your Commission. That, that cannot apply to you. You can't do it. But the apostles could. The Lord said, if thou say, mountain be moved, it'll be moved. He, and it would happen. You, the Lord's not a liar. Let's look at the next verse here. And this is the most popular verse everyone, everyone likes to use here. But you have to understand who it's talking to. This is the next verse. And all things, and all things, whatsoever ye shall ask, ye shall ask in prayer, believing ye shall receive. Now, folks, you know that that's a very popular um, thing, uh, verse there. And people apply that to their life, and they think that when they pray something, it's going to come to pass. They assume that it's going to come to pass because of what the verse says. But the Lord was talking to his apostles. He wasn't talking to you or me or anyone else in this dispensation of Gentile grace that we live in because it won't work. You know, you've tried it. You can try it right now. It won't work. But 
This is because it's not talking to you. You have to know what to pray for as you ought. And understand, God's not changing your circumstances. He's not giving you earthly blessings today. That verse and these other ones we're going to look at was talking to his apostles. And that was something for them to do as being uh, in, in, the, in a leadership role. After the Lord's death, he passed the baton to his apostles. They were going to be down here in his stead. They were going to be acting as if the, the son himself was walking on the earth. That doesn't apply to you. That, that doesn't apply to you today. So let's take a look at another verse. Come over, come over to um, Matthew 18. Matthew 18, verse 1. Matthew 18, verse 1. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? I'm going to stop there and notice. It said, the disciples came unto him. And let's just stay in the context. This is the disciples coming unto the, to the Lord and asking the Lord a question. And let's take a look at the response here. Come over here. Look at the look at look at the uh, um, uh, come down to uh, verse 18. Verily, because I just want to get the heart of the matter for time's sake. Verily, 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 I say unto you, and who is he talking to? The disciples. I say unto you, who, what's who's wh whosoever. Matter of fact, well, let me just back up again. <laughs> whatsoever ye shall bind in earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now notice what this is saying here. Whatsoever ye bind on earth. Can man do this today? No. And whatsoever ye loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is power given to the apostles and what the Lord is telling them. To, that only applies to them. This is only apostle, apostle doctrine applied to them. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For there, whether two or three gather together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Now you see that there? Verse 19 and 20 is what people use. They miss. They skip right over verse 18. Because they know they cannot make verse 18 work. They cannot make it work. But guess what? They try to force the issue, though. They, they'll, they'll tell what God he's going to tell God what he's going to do. They're going to say, well, God, you know, I need this. Can you if you do this, I'll I won't do that again or whatever the situation is. But guess what? That's. Make an appeal to God to 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 do what you want to do. But again, the other prior verse will, will not apply to them. They won't try to do that. Let's look at something else here. Come to verse 19. Verse 19. And I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching, as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. And we're looking at that again because this is what, this is what people use all the time. And they feel that there's two or more that uh, th that's going to make the prayer go over better. But again, if two of you, that's the disciples there. Two of you as touching anything, that's anything, that, that they shall ask, it shall be done of my Father which is in heaven. Look at, um, uh, again, you see who it's talking to there. But again, as I said at the outset, uh, we have to make sure we understand this is according to his will, according to his sake, not ours. It's not according to what we think that um, that we ought to, that we ought to have God do for us. And when you're looking at another thing, when it talked about all things or those things, let, let let's take a look at um, let's take a look at something else here. Come over to uh, Matthew chapter six. Matthew chapter six. Let's look at verse thirty-one. Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal we shall we be clothed? For all these things do this Gentile seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You see the list there about these things 
that Israel is supposed to pray for? Food, drink, and raiment. Eat, drink, clothe. All those things that Gentiles seek. We are Gentiles, folks. But this is talking to Israel here. The Lord was talking to Israel. And he says, the Lord know you have need of all these things. That's the necessity. Those are the things that they had need for. Those were all things that they were to pray for. Food, drink, and raiment. Not, not anything of, I want to be rich. or I want to. The Lord said, sell all your possessions. You know why? Because he was going to provide those things. And they were to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we, all, we also, well, folks, what we ought to do is our prayer ought to concern his, his word. And all things are the things that he's given us already. And we ought to pray in thanksgiving and desiring those things. Desiring to be clothed upon. That, that the, the eternal weight of glory that we're building up. And let's take a look at some. Come over, come back to Philippians. Philippians chapter 4. And let's take a look at something else and we're going to get ready to close pretty soon. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with re with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Now, that's where a lot of people say, hey, well, uh, send your prayer request in. This is to God, not, not to the man. But it says, be careful for nothing. Don't be so full of care for things. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. That's telling you right there that your requests ought to be according to God's will when you see the uh, what is being explained there. Be careful for nothing. Don't be so full of care for things. But let's let's read on. But that's that's what people use that verse too. They have it tattooed on them and everything else. Let's read the context. Come over to verse 7. And the peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts, your minds, and your minds through Christ Jesus. It's the peace of God that that's gonna uh, you'll get because you're using his word. His word causes you, uh, gives you the peace, that fruits of the spirit, fruits of his word. Which pass all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things, notice it says things. Look at all the things here. Notice the things that you are to set your affection on. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatever so things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. These are what we ought to think on. Where is their deliverance there? Where's Why would we want to um, have our sight set on other things? Those things there that you just seen are all things that are found in his word. There's not one of those things are carnal, folks. Not one of those things are of a fleshly nature that um, delivers our flesh. But we find people teaching that stuff. Let's look at verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. Notice the God of peace is going to be with you. The God of peace is going to be with you because you're going to find peace in his word when you're going through these things. But you got to learn this. You, got, you have to understand the doctrine. Understand the power of his will. Understand it's for his sake. That's why, that's why Paul says, when the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for, uh, for thee. Paul says, most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. Paul learned something. And let's take a look at what this, what he said he learned. Verse uh, 11. Not that I speak in respect of, of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be there with content. I know how to both be abased. I know how to bound. I, in everywhere, in all things. Notice, all things. In all things, I am instructed to be both full and to be hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do all things through Christ Jesus with strength in me. That's, you get people take that verse all the time. I can do all things through Christ Jesus with strength in me. But Paul is saying here, 
Paul says, in all things, I am instructed to be full and hungry. That's what Paul means. He can do all things. Paul's saying that he can be hungry in Christ Jesus. He can be full in Christ Jesus. He can go through the perils of robbers in Christ Jesus. He can, he can do all those beatings in Christ Jesus. He can do all the things that we've seen on the list and all the things that Paul went through. Paul said, I can do all those things in Christ Jesus which strengthen me, which his inner man is strengthened because of what he learned. And our inner man ought to be strengthened based upon what we learn. And we have to look at God's word in a spiritual mind, not in a carnal mind. Because when we take these verses and when you look at what's being said, if you look at it with carnal glasses on, you're going to think, I can do all things through Christ Jesus which strengthen me. So I can go jump off the bill. I can do anything. I can do all things because it says all things. I'm going to go do this here and Christ is going to strengthen me because that's that's what happens. And most people don't get to that extreme. But what happens is when you look at it with carnal glasses on, you're going to assume God's going to do something for you physically at, or in a carnal sense. To take something away from you or make sure something happens. Deliver you out of things. We are told God's word delivers us. Knowing God is the God of all comfort comforts us. We are to pray with thanksgiving. Thank him for all the things he's done. And if you look at just some of the things on the page right here, you've been predestinated. You've been foreknown. You've been called, justified, glorified. He's conforming you to the image of his son. He says he's for you. He's for us. Oh, just these things here. You've been uh, 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 giving you the spirit of adoption so we can be sons unto him. All these things we've been given, that ought to cause for thanksgiving. And that's not all. That's on one page. You also have to play, pray with supplication. That's sup supplying for other saints or other man mankind. I, you can pray that all men become saved and come into knowledge of truth. Or as Paul said, pray for men and all those in, thor in authority that we live a quiet and peaceable life. It's not that that's going to take place, but it's your heart desire. And your father can, be, can rejoice when your lips speak the right things. And you're not as a, as a simple son or fool because you're, 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 you're praying um, for something that God's not going to do. You ever notice the Corinthians? Paul never asked the Corinthians to pray for him. He never asked the first Corinthians to pray for him. He never asked the Galatians to pray for him. Second, the second book of Corinthians, he said their prayer helped. Hey, prayer was mentioned in that term because the Corinthians, the second Corinthian epistle the first epistle to the Corinthians, they were babes in Christ, he said. But that epistle took some took 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 uh, effect among them. They began to suffer for Christ's sake. They needed the second epistle written onto them. It's dedicated to sufferings. But again, we ourselves ought to pray without ceasing. We ought to pray with supplication, pray with thanksgiving. Give others the consolation doctrine, the consoling prayer, wherewith we ourselves are consoled of God. And when we ourselves are mature, we can give others the same consolation, consolation prayer. What, what we do that with the, to the Father. We don't need to um, uh, have a, a prayer request a moment. We don't need to have a prayer power hour. We don't need to... to um, um, Pray rep repetitiously. You pray without ceasing, as if you're right across the table with your father, and you're and you're letting him know your let him, letting him know your heart's desire. You're letting him know how his word is working effectually within you, and how you have not allowed it to work effectually within you as you ought to. You can come sorrowful with a godly sorrow, if that's the case, but also you can come with a rejoicement when when you can come to your father. In rejoicing how his word has effectually worked within you in your time of need or just in your time of glory. 
But again, there's going to be a part two to this. And um, tune in next time for that. With that, I'm going to close. And thank everyone for watching. Thank you.